Okay, good morning and welcome to our program. The State Library of North Carolina celebrates Hispanic heritage in North Carolina. I am Clarissa Arguello, the Outreach Librarian with the SLNC Government and Heritage Library. And just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Captioning is available to view closed captioning in this platform. Please use your mouse to hover over the control bar at the top or bottom of the screen. Click on the closed caption button. And then second, you can either show subtitle or view full transcript to see the captions during the presentation. To make any changes to the caption settings, click on the closed caption button, select subtitle settings options, a settings box will appear, click on the accessibility button and make any changes that you see fit. And then finally on that same toolbar, click on the chat button to bring up the chat box. Please send us a message um, through chat if you need any technical help or you have any questions you'd like to ask our presenters. And before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to tell you about the SLNC Government and Heritage Libraries services. We provide research assistance by phone, email, chat, and in person. And the link in the chat will take you to the SLNC homepage where you can view our hours. North Carolina residents can sign up for a library card with the link on the slide and in the chat, which allows access to many online subscription databases. You can also sign up for our mailing list to receive general news and updates from the State Library of North Carolina, as well as emails about programs and resources related to North Carolina history, genealogy, and educator resources. Please feel free to contact us if you have any questions or need any help. And now, welcome to our program. SLNC celebrates Hispanic heritage in North Carolina, and we would like to highlight the Hispanic and Latin American community in North Carolina, and we're very happy that the folks at the Institute for the Study of the Americas at UNC Chapel Hill are here to talk to us. Um, this presentation is being recorded and will be made available online, the State Library of North Carolina's YouTube channel. Once the, the program has ended, we'll send everyone a follow-up email with a list of resources from today's program, including the Government and Heritage Library's North Carolina Latin American Heritage Research Guide in both English and in Spanish. And now let me introduce our guests. Daniel Velasquez is the Community Documentarian at the Institute for the Study of the Americas, ISA, at UNC Chapel Hill where he works with the New Roots Archive, conducting oral history interviews, designing programming and workshops around New Roots content and supporting ISA's Building Integrated Lib Communities Initiative. Sorry, <laughs> I've got a lot of libraries in my head. <laughs> Daniel holds a master's degree in public history from the University of Central Florida and is completing a doctorate in history at UNC. His research interests and public history works center on the mi migratory links between Latin America and the U.S. South. He's conducted archival research in the United States, Mexico, Spain, and the United Kingdom, and has been involved in numerous pro projects ranging from historic preservation to history podcast production. He's also taught courses on Latin American studies and history at UNC and other NC institutions. And Skylar Z is the Outreach Coordinator for the Consortium in Latin American and Caribbean Studies at UNC and Duke University. Her work focuses on providing resources about Latin America and the Caribbean to K-12 through educators, community college educators, and the wider public. Thank you both for being here. Daniel, I'm going to let you share your slides. All right. <laughs> Do you see this okay? Yes. Okay. All right, well, hello. Uh, thank you very much, Clarissa, for introducing us and inviting us. And thanks everyone for joining us for this talk on North Carolina's Latin American heritage. I'm Daniel Velasquez. Um, and in the spirit of celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month, for about the next half hour, I'm going to be making some connections between uh, North Carolina's history and Latin American history. And I'll discuss how the population of North Carolinians with Latin American heritage has grown um, over the last century 
and also how you can continue exploring all of this and more through the New Roots Oral History Archive. I'll even share a couple of clips from some of our oral histories. Um, and after that, my colleague Skylar will briefly share some more of our resources that are great for anyone looking to learn about um, more about Latin America. First, uh, what is New Roots? New Roots or Nuevas Raices is a bilingual online archive and research initiative that since 2006 has collected stories of migration, uh, settlement, integration, leadership, and more in the form of oral history interviews. On our site, we have over 200 interviews that anyone can access to hear firsthand perspectives and explore Latin American and Caribbean heritage. It really is a, a wonderful resource and, and collection. I do hope many of you will check us out. Uh, the link to the site is above on this slide, newroots.lib.unc.edu. Um, okay, I'll share more about New Roots later. Uh, first, I'll get us started by talking about some of the parallel histories that I referenced before. And for that, we need to go a few hundred years back. Let me uh, poll the audience and ask, uh, what was the first European language spoken in North Carolina? Go ahead and, and put it in the chat. English, Portuguese, Spanish, German, Castellano, Dutch, French. Yeah, these are all great guesses. Okay, um, Irish, Gaelic. <laughs> uh, for um, so so the, the answer is actually Spanish. Um, I think someone did say Spanish. Uh, for anyone who didn't know, yes, uh, it is Spanish. You might have guessed, uh, given the nature of this presentation, but yes, Spanish. Um, in fact, Spaniards explored what today we call North Carolina as early as 1526, when Luca, Lucas Vasquez de Ayllon explored the outer banks and the coastal regions of the state. Uh, and Spaniards kept coming throughout the century. Uh, famously, in 1540, Hernando de Soto explored the North Carolina interior and the Blue Ridge Mountains, and he was likely the first European to have met with the ancestors of the Catawba and Cherokee tribes of, of North Carolina. Um, notice that all of this is happening in the half century or so before the failed English colony of Roanoke. Um, that's a story that many of you are probably more familiar with. Uh, perhaps most significant, though, is that in 1566, the Spaniards decided to build a series of forts in what today we call the U.S. Southeast, and some of these forts were located here in the present borders of North Carolina. These were built during uh, two expeditions headed by an explorer, na explorer named Juan Pardo, who landed in the South Carolina coast and made his way inward and northward building garrisons near Native American settlements, as you can see on the map that I have here on the right. Um, Santa Elena, Orista, Guatari, but, but the largest and, and most important was Fort San Juan near Juara. Juara was the name of the town and of the Native peoples that lived in that area where the Spanish built uh, Fort San Juan um, on the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains. Um, let me show you what Fort San Juan might have looked like. We, we know the precise location of Fort San Juan because archaeologists have found it. In, in 2013, the excavation that you see pictured on the left was confirmed to be Fort San Juan. It is in, in present-day Morganton in Burke County, uh, North Carolina. And on the right, you see an artist's representation of the building of the fort uh, and settlement. Now, uh, the Spanish purpose in the area was to help them solidify claims to the region, but the forts and settlements did not survive very long. Uh, this, this larger one at Fort San Juan lasted only a couple of years, for instance. 
But uh, one of the aspects that I find uh, very interesting in this in this history in this in this short existence of Force and One is that it likely presented a, a unique multilingual space in which Spanish was thrust into the existing Native American language language geographies of the pre-colonial uh, North Carolina. So in Jawara or Force and One those languages would have been um, likely Cherokee or, or Yuchi. And, and, and this brief period of North Carolina history mirrors Latin American history. Uh, this is a moment of shared history because the Spanish insertion in North Carolina on a much smaller scale uh, was similar to the way in which Spanish was inserted in most of the other places that we now call Latin America throughout the colonial period. And just like Cherokee and Yuchi and many of those native languages, languages other than Spanish, um, they are still spoken throughout Latin America to this day. So here's another question for you. How many languages do you think are spoken in Latin America today? And I think we have a multiple choice option for this one. And if you don't see that, you could put it in the chat. Oh, here we go. Multiple choice option. One hundred to five hundred is winning with forty six percent, forty eight percent. Yeah. Y'all definitely think it's a lot, it seems, at least. OK, well, in fact, um, it is more than 500 D was right, Hania. Uh, We'll put it in the chat to you that that is correct. Um, I've actually seen estimates that range from about 1500 all the way to 7000, depending on how some of the dialects or, or variations of some of the major language groups like Mayan are counted. Um, I saw that someone raised their hand. We will have a question and answer um, session at the end. So just hold that for a moment. But anyway, lots of a lot of languages are spoken in in uh, Latin America. Uh, the point is that much like North Carolina has been through the centuries, Latin America is very linguist linguistically diverse. A lot more so actually since it's such a large, uh, vast region. Um, Spanish and Portuguese are widely spoken, of course, and there are many Creole languages. Uh, there are also hundreds of indigenous languages that continue to thrive throughout the region such as Nahuatl, which is uh, still spoken in Mexico today. Uh, there are the Mayan languages of Southern Mexico and Central America. Um, there are uh, Quechua langu languages in the Andes in South America, Guarani in Peru, and, and I could go on. Um, but beyond language, Latin America is, is very di a very diverse region for historic reasons that also mirror processes that occurred here in North Carolina. I've mentioned the Spanish, and of course, as the main colonizers in the Americas, they set roots throughout. Uh, and there were other Europeans who migrated to Latin America as well, not only in the colonial period, but in the centuries after, um, just like was the case for, for the United States. But like native peoples and, and European descended peoples, People of African descent, likewise, are a very important part of the population and, and diversity of Latin America. And that's because uh, starting in 1526 and for almost 400 years, millions of African people, peoples, uh, primarily from West and Central Africa, as you can see on the map on the left, were forced to migrate to the Americas in a process that we now call the transatlantic slave trade. And uh, this was the case for North Carolina, of course. Um, this is another shared history between our state and, and, and Latin America. I want to draw your attention to the pie chart that you see on the right that shows the destinations of enslaved people during the transatlantic slave trade. Um, notice that out of the 10.5 million people who made it across the Atlantic, uh, North America was the destination of only about 4%. Um, North America, including the United States and Mexico and, uh, and, and Central America, that was only 4%. Um, if you look at the rest of the pie chart, 
um, South America, not counting Brazil, 7%. It, meant, it shows Africa 1%. That's because of, of ships that were turned around, um, the different proxies. But notice the Caribbean, 43%, and Brazil, 45%. These were the main destinations of, um, of enslaved people uh, who were forced to migrate to the Americas. Um, very important parts of the population there, of course, important parts of the population uh, throughout uh, Latin America. Here is um, um, a startling statistic that I think really helps to illustrate the, the impact on uh, the demographic change of the transatlantic slave trade. Um, Brazil is the uh, country with, more, with the most Afro-descended people in the world after Nigeria. So Brazil has more Afro-descended people than any country in Africa outside of, of Nigeria. It's really kind of drives home the impact of, of the transatlantic slave trade, um, which is a history that we could keep talking about, uh, but I'll leave it there for now and just say that these, these encounters between European, Native, and African peoples, all of whom came from many, many ethnic backgrounds, is, is what makes Latin America, Latin, America, Latin American people today. I really can't emphasize diversity enough because just like Europeans are not one group, the uh, terms Native American and, and African ha in a way flatten out a lot of diversity. Uh, there are lots of ethnic groups within um, those larger categories. Anyway, no region of Latin America was unchanged by this century long, centuries long process, this coming together of such an incredible ethnic mosaic. All of this created something new, the, the Latin American peoples of today. Um, there is no precise definition for Latin America, but this is how I would start to define it, by the peoples and, and the histories that made them and created the new nations of, of today. Of course, speaking of nations on a basic level, we can simply define the region by its political geography, which um, you can see on, on this map uh, includes, starting from the north, includes Mexico in North America, uh, the countries of, of Central America and the Caribbean, um, all of South America, um, so on. Um, okay, so to bring this back to North Carolina, as everything I've just shared with you might suggest, Latin America is home to a tremendous range of traditions that are unique to specific countries and regions. Uh, and since North Carolinians with Latin American ancestry as a whole have roots throughout Latin America, many of these rich traditions and languages have made it to our state and have been integrated here, which is um, wonderful. In, in, a lot, in a lot of ways, we see Latin American diversity um, manifested throughout North Carolina. And I'd like to share one example of that with you that is drawn from our oral histories. Uh, in her 2018 New Roots interview, uh, Jesenia Pedro Vicente talks about the annual food festival uh, of St. Charles uh, Borromeo Church in Morganton. Uh, first, to give you some context, uh, Jesenia is an educator. She was born and raised in Morganton, uh, but has Guatemalan roots. And just before this interview, she was getting ready to go to, a, to her hometown to join um, this festival. Uh, so let's, let's have a listen. The, the, the clip is only about three minutes. So uh, I hope you enjoy hearing this story. So I'm going home because I want to go to the St. Charles Borromeo Festival. Um, it's their international food festival. So every year it is, it's a tradition at this point. I know it's been going on since at least the mid to early 2000s. So it's, it's been a quite a few years. Um, in fact, my, when I was in high school, my sisters and some of our friends performed dances at this, like Mayan, traditional Mayan dances at this event. So it's, basically this gathering of the different communities in the church. Um, Morganton actually has a large Mayan community and a large Hmong community in addition to African American and white and people who identify with their Irish, Polish, German heritage and so this festival is a great way for these communities to come together and they all 
in the like mess hall that we have, you have just dozens of tables and booths that have the names of the countries that are being represented and the food that's going to be sold there. And it's all pretty cheap. And so you can walk around and you'll have Vietnamese, Hmong, different food from different regions of Guatemala, Polish, mm -hmm. German, Spanish, and just you get to sample all of these different foods. And um, it started out as mainly the church members coming out to it, but as the years have gone by, more and more community members are attending this, even if they don't go to St. Charles Borromeo. So it's, I love it. I think it's an organic way of kind of bringing different people together. So the mess hall itself has a lot of the food. There are also booths set up outside, so it's grown. This is the other amazing part, is that each year, more and more vendors have signed up to sell food, so there are vendors outside. And the cultural performances, either from, you know, the Hmong group, the Mayan groups, the Mexican, whoever it might be, they there is an outside space in the parking lot where performances happen. So you can see, even from the street, if you're driving by, that there is something going on. There are performances, there's food, it's you know, and I think that that has attracted passersby. I mean, it sounds like it's just a celebration of people's immigrant ancestry. Yes. And some people, for some people, that was many generations ago, mm -hmm. others more recent. But it's really a space where, you know, it's not, the focus isn't all on the newest immigrant communities, but it's on right. sort of thinking about how everybody has that connection, most, almost everybody. Yes. Yes, yeah. it's not just, yes, yeah. you're right, it's not just the new immigrants. You will have members of the church who, ha you know, have gone to St. Charles their whole lives, mm -hmm. and they're there with their booth. Yeah. So it is, I love it because it's one of the, like, earliest examples of a celebration of multiculturalism, mm -hmm. and, you know, it being celebrated. I remember people, after my sisters and I would perform, they'd mm -hmm. be like, oh my god, that was so great, and it wasn't just Guatemalan people saying it, you know, you'd have yeah. members from different communities saying wow, I love your traje. Well, they didn't know it's a traje, but I love your outfit. That was so great, and it's just very affirming. Uh, and that was Hannah Gill, who was uh, the interviewer for that for that oral history. I love that story, and uh, in that Jesenia mentions at the end that, that she feels very affirmed. She has a sense of belonging, and I hope that uh, this starts to give you a sense of how oral history can be a, a powerful method for understanding experiences like Jesenia's and, and, and this unique festival. And there are many other festivals and, and other cultural celebrations that connect our state to Latin America. My heritage is Colombian, and I know there is a very large Colombian festival in Charlotte, for example, and there are Haitian festivals in Charlotte as well. Um, there is a, a yearly festival in Sebulin that is um, that is linked to central Mexican traditions. Uh, nowadays, there, there are lots of ways to connect with Latin American um, heritage here in, in North Carolina. Um, and such diversity of Latin American tradi traditions in our state, of course, occurred through migration. Um, as I mentioned previously, the Spanish were the first Europeans to explore what today we call North Carolina in the colonial period. But their presence at, the, at that time was short-lived, as I said. Uh, we are learning, though, that there were sustained connections between the U.S., Southeast, and Latin America, and the Caribbean during the 19th century. There's new scholarly research on that, um, including some of my own. And, and actually, through some of our other projects here at ESA, we are learning that coastal North Carolina specifically had various commercial and migratory links with Latin America throughout the uh, 19th century. However, most North Carolinians with Latin American roots either came or, or are descended from 20th and 21st century migrants. Um, so let's take a look at this timeline. Scholars estimate that there were about 3,000 people with Latin American roots in North Carolina in, in 1900. Uh, we then see an uptick in migration from Latin America after 1965 and through the second half of the 20th century. Uh, 1965, because that is when Congress passed the Immigration and Nationality Act, which basically stopped discrimination in immigration policies that had largely favored Western European countries before this. Um, and at the same time, 
um, in the second half of the 20th century. Uh, this is a period in which the United States was heavily engaged in military and economic interventions in Latin America, which we now know is one of the root causes of migration. And of course, um, migrants were coming for a lot of other reasons as well, including being recruited into many North Carolina industries from farm work to furniture building to biomedical manufacturing, et cetera. Thus, the uh, Latin American population in North Carolina jumps from about 7,500 in 1970 to 64,000 just 20 years later. And then in just 10 years, the population goes from 64,000 increasing to 375,000 by the year 2000. Tremendous increase um, for North Carolina. So now let's, let me ask you another question. Um, how many North Carolinians have Latin American today? Latin American heritage today. So go ahead and put in the chat what you think. And remember that the figure was 375,000 in the year 2000. So what is it about now? And I'll look it up, just look what you think. Fifteen percent. Uh, Donna says two million. Uh, Janine says fifty percent. Any other? One point five million. Uh, Michelle says thirty-nine. Maybe that's means percent. One million. Oh yeah, nine percent. And Michelle says one point two million. One one point two million is actually a uh, actually very close. Uh, in fact, North Carolinians with Latin American ancestry. Are, are part of diverse community, communities of more than 1 million people in the state, representing um, almost 11% of the population. Though, to be more exact, 1,118,596 as counted in the uh, 2020 um, census. About 11%, almost 11% of the population. And note that six in 10 of the over 1 million people are actually born here in the United States. A majority of North Carolinians with Latin American ancestry are born in the United States. Um, some other interesting census uh, facts, um, they, they also tell us the primary countries of origin uh, of Latin America in North Carolina, uh, including those born in the United States, 54% uh, identify uh, as Mexican as their primary ancestry. 11% identify as Puerto Rican. Um, another 19% are of Central American backgrounds like Salvadoran, Honduran, Guatemalan. Of course, I think all of Latin America is represented in some way in North Carolina, but these are some of the uh, primary sending communities. And um, if you're interested in exploring more about North Carolina's Latin American heritage, let me suggest to you again uh, that oral history is a great method for better understanding people's histories and experiences. And you can find hundreds of stories on the New Roots archive. Um, we've made it easy to navigate as each interview is categorized by the themes covered. So you can sort through it that way. Um, as you can see on the... Um, Screenshot on the right, um, our themes range very widely. Some of the bigger ones include citizenship and immigration, of course, but also identity, culture, education. We touch on economics, um, healthcare, even COVID-19 and, and climate change uh, feature here. Uh, we also have interactive maps that help sort through the interviews. Um, I picture one here on the left where visitors to our site can click on a North Carolina county and see what interviews we may have from that county. And there's another map um, on the site where you can sort through um, a map of Latin America where you, you can sort through interviews through um, by, uh, by country of origin. Okay, but the best way to show you new routes, I think, is to um, <clears throat> give you a sample. I already did with um, with Yesenia. Here's another one. This one's a video. Um, I'd like to share with you this short clip from one of our interviewees. His name is Tacito George. 
He is from the Dominican Republic, and, and he's a teacher. New Roots originally interviewed him in 2015. The video is in Spanish, but it has uh, English subtitles. Um, I hope you'll enjoy hearing Tacito talk about one of the many things that he learned after migrating to North Carolina. So uh, let's have a look. This is my story. This is my story. Buenas noches, soy Michelle Carreño, estudiante de la Universidad de Carolina Norte. Hoy es el 17 de abril y tengo el placer de entrevistar a Tacito George. Bueno, para las personas que van a escuchar es, o leer esta entrevista, ¿nos podrías hacer una pequeña biografía introductoria? Como tú dices, biografía introductoria <risa> de... ¿A, a qué llega este país? De lo que tú quieras contar. ¿no? Yo no sabía cocinar. A mí me lo hacían todo en mi casa, en la República. Pero me cansé de comer comida china. Y llamé por teléfono a mi mamá y le dije, explícame cómo cocinar. No sabía ni perrar un plato. ¿no? Y me explicó por teléfono. Claro, no tenía la práctica que tengo ahora. Pero como ella me explicó, con la práctica tú vas a aprender a hacerlo. Eh, cuando llegué aquí no existía el internet, por ende, si me hubiese hecho más fácil si existiera, porque ya todo está online, te lo explican fácil y tú puedes ver en YouTube alguien haciéndolo. Estamos esperando ya que el plátano esté para hacer el proceso de majarlo. Vamos a comer hoy a, eh, lo que le llamamos nosotros mangú, que es plátano hervido. Luego yo lo, uh, lo voy a hacer como un puré, con mantequilla. ¿Ves que suavecito está el plátano ya? Este es el proceso ahora de suavizarlo. Bien. Este es el salami. Este lo consigo en una tienda hispana. Pero tiene que ser una hispana, diríamos, de origen dominicano. La línea uh, Compare Food. Ellos tienen, para satisfacer todos los... Uh, Latinos. Yo soy maestro de matemáticas. En high school, Wake Forest. Allá hay más dominicanos en lo que es Wake Forest. Mil personas a lo mejor. Ahora Ese es el tono del huevo que le gusta al dominicano. Ese es el tono. Ese es el color. No le gusta blanco. Tiene que estar así. Si no se lo da así, yo... Dan complejo, ¿no? el, el mangú fue, viene de la historia de que alguien le dio a probar el plato, este plato, a, a uno de los militares que estaban establecidos allá por la invasión que nos hicieron los norteamericanos. Entonces le dio a probar el, 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 el platillo y la persona dijo, man, good. Y de ahí se quedó el nombre, mangú. <risa> Oye, ¿a dónde va a llegar el mangú, Dios mío? Va a estar en la televisión. Algo increíble. Aquí tiene un delicioso mangú dominicano con cebollita, longaniza, queso frito, salami y huevo. Oye Jaime, aquí está Gardel. Esto es para los bailadores, para los rumberos, para el mundo entero. Salsa con 
Well, that's that's the Cito. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, to to end my part of this of this presentation, I wanted to show you a brief sampling of some of the other New Roots interviews um, that you can encounter on our website to give you an idea of the wide of the wide range of spaces that Latin American people occupy here, and and which our archive um, captures. Uh, we have stories like uh, Felicia Riaga, who was a Duke graduate student and is now a, a writer and a professor. Um, Guillermina Castillo is a restaurant worker, and she talks a lot about the challenges of, of maintaining her family's connections to her country of origin, especially her daughters who were uh, born here. Uh, Isaias Garcia Garcia, a barbershop owner who talks about the challenges of starting their own business. Um, who can't relate to that, who was a business owner. Yeah, Ivan Parra identified a need in the community and, and helped to found the Latino Credit Union. Um, Maylin Reyes Rodriguez, a uh, psychiatrist and researcher here at UNC, who, who tells us about the importance of maintaining cultural values within healthcare services. And uh, we have a lot more. Okay, I hope that you visit our site. Here is the link again. Uh, neurus.lib.unc.edu, uh, and you'll you'll browse through our stories. But I will leave it there for now and pass it on to Skylar, who will tell you about um, other resources besides New Roots that we have available at ESA. So, Skylar. Thank you, Daniel. So one of the materials that we've made available for participants in this um, webinar is a lesson plan building off of an oral history that you already heard from Yesenia, um, where you can access it at the link at go.unc.edu slash HHNC2023. Um, and you can see a little snippet. Um, this would be a good resource for teachers of a variety of um, different age groups. We have the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction standards in there for recommended um, standard connections to this oral history. So please check that out. We also have plenty of other resources for those looking to learn more about Latin America and the Caribbean. We have an extensive collection of Latin American book sets. We have over 300 books that we lend to teachers for a semester at a time, um, ranging from elementary level books to high school level books. Spanish, English, and bilingual books are all available, and you can check those out at our website, um, and we will send them to you, teachers, for free to use with your students for a semester at a time to support learning about Latin America and the Caribbean. Similarly, we have a Latin American film library with all kinds of films, um, and you can search by country to check out a film. We can ship that or send it to you. And um, for teachers, we have suggested films that you can use in your classroom that address different topics in the North Carolina standards. We have a collection of podcasts about Latin America that you can access on our website to learn more. Again, you can search by country or by topic. And you can contact us to have more conversations about this or to be provided with more resources. Um, you can contact Daniel um, at his email or myself. And finally, we hope that you visit our website for the Institute for the Study of the Americas, isa.unc.edu, to check out all of this and more. And that's it. Thank you, everyone, for our listening. Um, I think we now have a question and answer session. Yes. <laughs> um, we do have some questions. Let's see. Let's get into those questions. Um, can you name a Latin American place that is important to your community and why it's important? And I guess this is a question not just for 
both of you, but for everyone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is this was something that we wanted to uh bring in the audience about uh, um bring in the audience to um to see like what connections folks ha might have to Latin America. Right. So if anyone wants to go ahead and put you know, share that with us in the chat. That would be great. Um, we also have someone who had their hands raised. Um, I believe Rhonda, if you would like to ask your question in the chat. We also have some questions in the chat that we could address already. Yes. Are the book sets that can be borrowed in Spanish also? Yes, there are a variety of books. Some are Spanish language text only, some are English language text only, and then some are bilingual. Um, I'm happy to talk with you more about that where you can read a little bit more about the book sets on our website. Okay. Um, and um, how do you pick who you interview for oral histories? Um, well, a, a lot of times it's, <clears throat> um folks who happen to be in who have connections in Hannah Gill's class Hannah Gill our uh, associate director at ESA teaches an oral history class in which she teaches students how to uh, conduct oral history and then this part of the project in the class is that students have to collect oral histories of their um on their own and so that the connections that those students make guide um some of those oral histories that we end up archiving but we also uh do a lot of outreach in the community and and identify people that, that, who have stories that they want to share and um who make it make it to our archive um <clears throat> i have done uh, oral histories with leaders in north carolina uh, this is a recent initiative but we just we have in it's since 2006 we've well new roots has been collecting a lot of um interviews and, and stories and so through the many activities of isa and, and our other initiatives. Uh, we learn about people and, and we ask if they would like to be interviewed and many times they uh, they say yes. Um, and so <laughs> to go back to the uh, name a Latin American place that is important to, to your community and why, um, I just wanted to share that um, I recently moved here uh, and I moved here from Miami and um, my parents are both Nicaraguan. And so um, I love going to the El Mandalo supermarket because I feel like I can buy a lot of things that I could buy in Miami and that my parents will bring me when they visit. And that is an important connection for me, you know, to my Latin American history and Latin American heritage. Um, and so that's just, I love going there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Those places are, are, are important links. Uh, my mother was visiting over the weekend and, and we went to La Superior because that's in Durham, because that's where she could find some of the ingredients that she needed to make a, um, a Colombian dish that she was making for us over the weekend. So that's those are great places in my in my home community um, there. There is a large uh, Mexican population as well. And so that's an important link um, in the area where I live. I mean, as, as Hannah says on the um, on the chat, we invite you to connect with us if you're interested in sharing your story as well. Um, it says here, Donna put, thanks. I work with students who have middle school immersion students, teachers who have middle school immersion students who are continually improving their Spanish, be they heritage speakers of Spanish newcomers or Spanish learners. And um, yes, welcome. <laughs> Uh, and then someone asked, Maxine asked, um, they're in High Point and they would like to know of any authors in North Carolina. Any authors in North Carolina? Specifically, are Spanish, uh, Spanish speaking or Spanish language, Maxine? Maybe you can, yes, she says yes. Um, I is that if it's referring to the book sets, I think Skylar could uh, could speak to that. But I do want to address uh, Donna's uh, comment. Yeah, I, I think our resources uh, will be helpful to your students 
uh, whether they're heritage speakers of Spanish or newcomers. Uh, and the interviews, I think, will be great also um, because you can find uh, interviews in Spanish and in English on our, on our archive. Uh, if that question was about are any of the authors of any of the books we have in our book sets from North Carolina, um, we have one book from the book set that was written by a former student of UNC Chapel Hill. Um, but I will do some more research about uh, what other authors may have links to North Carolina that we offer. We offer. Uh, someone else asked if either of you have been to the site of the archaeological dig. It is on my list. It is pending. Um, <clears throat> I haven't been to Burke County, actually, but I, I would like to. Um, we, we have a center here at UNC that has done a lot of studies of the archaeological dig. And in fact, the map that I showed of the explorations comes from that um, center of the early North Carolinians um, center. So I know a lot about it through there, but I would like to go for sure. Um, I, I see Jennifer also asked, do you all ever come to um, the community and talk to students? And yes, absolutely. New Roots does um, oral history workshops in which we teach how to do um, oral histories to community members or to students uh, who uh, might be interested uh, because it's such a, a great tool for capturing, documenting, and, and preserving stories. Uh, and so we do we do that a lot. Um, we might do some we we plan to do some more of that in the spring as well. Um, it says food, as in most cultures, seems to be very important. Do you have a book or a website with a specialty or everyday foods? <laughs> Maybe part of the um, of the the educator resources or anything about food, Skylar. There are some of the books that talk about food. Um, specifically, we have a Hispanic heritage book set um, that kind of talks about food and histories. Um, so that's definitely a good option. Yeah, food's a great connector. <laughs> it's not all, but it's a, it brings people together. I, I don't have I don't have um, uh, a book uh in mind that is about food but uh, i see donna is asking if we would offer this webinar content in spanish for middle school dual language immersion students um contact us donna uh, we would be happy to explore that option anyone who is sharing information that um that they would like to share with everyone else we can add that at the at when uh, when our video goes live on uh, our YouTube channel, um, I'll make sure to collect the some of the comments in our in the chat so that everyone can and can see that can can get this information. Um, Beatrice says there are some great films that feature Latin American communities in North Carolina, and you know the both of you have shared some, so I'll make sure that that's all included. Yeah, check out our um, our film library too. Does anyone have any other questions? Rachel, I'm so glad to hear that you were sharing this with your ESL students in uh, in Western North Carolina. Uh, and thank you, thanks to everybody for uh, listening to our talk today. Thank you all. And for specialized questions, yes, we'll make sure to share Daniel and Skyler's information. And let's see, um, just for future events, if uh, anyone has, if anyone's local to the Raleigh area, October 25th, the State Library and State Archives of North Carolina will be presenting an NC Trivia Night here in the Raleigh Times from seven to nine. Um, you can get more information about our upcoming events at the link in the slide and on our mailing list. Um, also, please take a few minutes to answer our survey and um, you'll all receive the same survey when you um, end 
the when we end the session. Um, <clears throat> and thank you again, you know, Daniel and Skylar, thank you for sharing about um, the Latin American community in North Carolina. We learned so much. I learned so much today. I know everyone did. Thank you to Kate Tompkins, our education and instruction librarian, for being our chat moderator. Um, and um, is there anything else anyone else would like to to share? <laughs> we're we're ending a little early. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Clarissa, for inviting us. This was wonderful. I again, I mean, it's just so interesting. Um, the history is so in, so interesting. I love knowing that Spanish was the first European language spoken here. I thought that was that's a little cocktail fact <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that I'll be sharing with others. Um, yeah, thank you. Muchas gracias. Like, sí, gracias, gracias a todos. And All right. Thank you, everyone.